Good morning, Arise Church family. Um, I have a super short passage today, so listen. (laughs) Think in pictures. That's one thing I've heard lately. Um, So think about it as I'm reading it. It's from um, Luke 13, verses 17 and 18. Then Jesus said, what is the kingdom of God like? How can I illustrate it? It's like a tiny mustard seed that a man planted in a garden It grows and becomes a tree, and the birds make nests in its branches. You can be seated. Good morning. My name is Sam, and I have uh, the honor of serving as an assistant pastor here at Arise Church. Um, Is there any gardeners with us this morning? Because I was told that Memorial last weekend is like, prime planting season. Is that true? Are they just pulling my leg? It's true? Okay, because I'm really excited this morning to dive into God's Word and talk about a man planting a seed and and what God has to say in it uh, and what he has for us. And so uh, as we begin, I just want to start with some prayer and put this um, before the Lord. Uh, God, we know there is power in Uh, your word. There's life. There's transformation, Lord. Uh, And so uh, would you speak, Lord, uh, to each and every single one of us, Lord? May these be your words and not mine. Would you clothe me in humility? Would you hide me behind the cross, Lord, so we can receive uh, what you want to say? Amen. If you've been with us for the last several weeks, you know we're uh, in a series where we look at the questions that Jesus asked uh, in the Gospels, and they are brilliant. They are powerful. Uh, Sometimes it's in a relational question. Uh, Sometimes um, it's in a uh, teaching format, but they are always powerful and brilliant, and we've been looking at uh, why Jesus has been asking them and uh, what is in these questions. And last week, uh, Pastor Jim talked about the question when Jesus asked his disciples, do you want to leave me too? When the teaching's hard to receive, when the path is not easy, when, it, when we don't even like what we're seeing sometimes, are we really going to follow Jesus? It was an awesome, powerful teaching. I highly encourage you to go back and take a listen. And this morning, if you're paying attention, Jesus' question for us was, what is the kingdom of God like? And so for the next, I don't know, the rest of summer, we're going to be spending all that on packet uh, because we really could. Unfortunately, Pastor Joel said I have half an hour And so I'm going to do my best, but we could spend so long just unpacking this one question. This is a very provocative question, a challenging question uh, that we get to wrestle with, but it's going to be good, and I'm excited. Uh, But Jesus asks the people he's speaking with this question, and he follows it up with a parable. Now, I need a quick show of hands. How many of you grew up in an education system uh, where a parable was a primary teaching tool? Oh man, that's none of us. Maybe, well, was it? Okay, I've got one of us. All right, so that's uh, going to put me in a challenge because we don't, we don't teach, we don't talk in parables. We don't teach in parables. And so if you're new to church, old to church, we've got to be on the same page and ask the question, what's a parable? We've got to be, if we're going to walk through what Jesus is teaching and why he asked this question, we got to be on the same page of what a parable is. So a parable is usually a narrative, a story, grounded in real life to provoke an audience on a spiritual point. So it's a narrative. It usually, uh, it's, it's a picture. It's, it's, it's a little uh, something, a framework uh, that the teacher would use. And it's grounded in real life. This isn't some pie in the sky idea. It would be like, it's a tree. Here's a tree you could see. It's tangible. It's real. You can grasp it. But the goal of the parable is really to provoke, to disrupt, to challenge how you think on a spiritual point. That is why uh, it's an Eastern method of teaching. It's much more of a rabbi style of teaching. And we're not used to that. So it's going to challenge us and how we think, how we process. And as we walk through this, you're going to see Jesus step on not only the toes of the people he's preaching to, but if we're paying attention, it probably, I almost guarantee you it, it's going to step on our toes. So Jesus starts off this parable, he starts off 
getting them to think, getting them to wrestle, because that's the point of a parable. He's challenging them to think deeply with the question, what is the kingdom of God like? Now, I think for his original audience, uh, it's kind of provocative. Because if anyone should know the answer, they should know it. Uh, where if you look back in Luke, we're in chapter 13, you're following along. Jesus is teaching in a synagogue. Uh, it is their church. They are uh, gathered uh, around the word of God. And I'm not just talking uh, they look at it and read it once and then they put it away. Uh, this was their entire culture, that they would read it every week, that they would memorize it, that I'm talking the entire Old Testament, they would have memorized uh, their way of life, their culture. Everything was centered around knowing God's word and what God has to say. They were people so devoted to the text. Crazy. So if there's anyone who is going to be able to answer Jesus' question, what is the kingdom of God like? It should have been them. And for you and me, I go, I do not really know Jesus. That's kind of new language sometimes for me to hear. We don't really talk about kingdoms as much these days, but I would be like, are you going to have to teach me? But for them, they probably would have known. Or at least could have said, this is what we think the kingdom of God looks like, because that's what they would come around, and they would talk about, and they would pursue, and they would study what the kingdom of God is going to be like. So his opening question, what is the kingdom of God like? I think he's, he's, he's poking at him. He's trying to get him to think. They're like, all right, Jesus is about to teach us something and challenge the way we see the world around this. Uh, this is what I mean, how, like, I think he's provoking him. Um, so imagine Jordan Love, quarterback, NFL Green Bay Packers. Is he a top 10 quarterback? Top, top, top. Okay, we got okay, a couple of sports fans. Uh, I'd be like me walking up to Jordan Love and be like, all right, Jordan Love, the man who's dedicated his entire life to playing professional football at the highest level possible. Do you really want to learn how to play football? I mean, if you'd look at me and be like, okay, it's ridiculous. Uh, this would be looking at um, Peter Jackson, the director of the greatest trilogy of all time in Lord of the Rings. You can fight me later on it. But he, and walking up to Peter Jackson, be like, all right, Peter Jackson, you really want to learn how to make a trilogy? I'll show you how to make a trilogy. That's what, G, that's what I mean. He is stepping on their toes. He's like, all right, you think you really know what the kingdom of God is like? You think you really grasp it, you understand it? Let me show you what the kingdom of God is like. All right. What happens when we get our toes stepped on? Do we like it? We like thrill. Usually, no, it doesn't really feel that good. We don't usually like it when someone pokes us, disrupts us, challenges us, gets in our face. But what happens when that takes place? There's an opportunity to respond to it. And there's an opportunity to see the world differently. And there's an opportunity to grow. So I don't know how many of you guys want to grow this morning, but that's what I'm excited about. I want to see what Jesus is doing here and willing to let him uh, provoke us uh, to challenge how we think. And so uh, we go to uh, verse uh, 19. What is the kingdom of God like? He says, it's like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. All right, Jesus, challenging me with this parable. What is the kingdom of God like? It's like a tiny little mustard seed that a man planted, and it grew and made a difference, and it made an impact. This tiny little thing made a huge difference. And uh, mustard seeds are tiny. I think we have a picture of one. Uh, these things, uh, if you blink, uh, you'll miss it. Like, this is, these are really small, insignificant things. Uh, in fact, this is a tool that not only Jesus as a teacher referenced, but other teachers would too as well. Whenever you talk about something tiny, something insignificant, you would compare it to a mustard seed because of how tiny these little guys are. Um, and so Jesus is like, the kingdom of God is like this tiny little insignificant thing that makes the biggest difference. The tiniest thing making the biggest difference. It's about the tiniest thing making the biggest difference. And I think we know this, right? You guys are really smart. Um, We have sayings uh, and little axioms, little things. Uh, You eat an elephant how many bites at a time? 
Oh, okay. Uh, the journey of a thousand miles starts with one. Okay, so we know the smallest little thing, one step, one bite, makes the difference. It changes and makes an impact. If those little things add up, that changes everything. We know this. But I don't think, as much as we know this kind of stuff, I don't think we like believing it or living it out. Partly because of the culture we live in, which is um, a consumer-driven culture, which means everything we have around us has to be about how big, awesome, powerful, loud I can sell you on something. Because if you're going to buy my product or services and not the next guy's, I got to be louder. I got to offer you something shinier, more awesome, whatever you want to say. Because think about it. Everyone walk up to you and be like, hey, I want to sell you something tiny and insignificant. You're like, I'm buying that. Instead, you'd go to the guy who's like, yeah, I got something powerful and awesome and in your face, and you would want, you're like, yeah, sign me up for that. That sounds good. We live in a world that celebrates the big, awesome, already grown tree, and we don't live in a world that celebrates the tiny, little, insignificant thing. Yeah, Jesus is saying, what's the kingdom of God like? How does it function? What does it look like? It looks like the tiny thing, that if you blinked, you would miss it. It's the smallest thing makes the biggest difference. I go, okay, Jesus, I'm following you. I'm tracking with you. Um, but that's not very spiritual, is it, though? I mean, somewhat. But, it, but Jesus is trying to provoke and step on the toes of people. He's trying to get, challenge them to think differently. And these are people who memorized, you know, Scripture. They were fine detail. These were people who paid attention to stuff. So is it really about the smallest thing making the biggest difference, Jesus, or is there more? Because I would go, man, Jesus, of all the plants you could talk about, like why a mustard? Like they look kind of like more like a bush, actually, if you start getting in the botany. Again, not a gardener. I did a bunch of research on this, and they look like a, a mustard plant looks more like a bush. And I go, man, Jesus, like we're talking about the kingdom of God, and he's like, it looks like that. And I just go, what? It seems kind of bizarre. And then I got a whole lot of questions, Jesus. Why is this gardener making a garden? Why is he planting the seed to begin with? And then of all the stuff that you're going to talk about what a tree does, how beautiful, how majestic its leaves, its branches, all the kind of stuff, why are you talking about birds? Doesn't that seem really bizarre? And if we were sitting with Jesus when he first told this parable— and we had the entire scripture memorized, we would have heard Jesus quote a verse from the Old Testament about birds nesting in branches. And we go, oh, is Jesus taking us back to identify something that God has already said about his kingdom? And that is what Jesus is doing. This is a spiritual journey, a spiritual point he's taking us on. And so for us to go back, we're going to go back into the book of Ezekiel. Now, for us to understand what's happening in Ezekiel, we, we're going to need some context. Uh, when the book of Ezekiel is written, the prophet Ezekiel shows up on the scene. Uh, the Israelites are in exile. They're in Babylon. Things have gone terribly wrong. Uh, their cities destroyed. Uh, they are conquered. They're getting carried off uh, into a foreign land and... It, is, it looks terrible. And what do you need when you're in exile? What do you think you need? You need a little bit of hope. Because it looks like the people you love and care about have been decimated. It looks like God has abandoned you. It looks like the future for the things uh, you care about are over. Where's the hope? And so God sends uh, different prophets, and one of them he sends is Ezekiel to give them some hope. And the book of Ezekiel is an awesome book. It's got some of the craziest stuff in the Bible. It's got, like, talks about wheels inside of wheels inside of wheels. Like, there's some really strange stuff going on. But when we begin to understand that Ezekiel was written to send the people in exile hope, that this is not the end for Israel. Tracking with me? All right, so we're going to go to Ezekiel 17, verse 22. 
Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. And on the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. And it will dwell every kind of bird, and the shade of its branches, birds of every sort, will nest. And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring the low, the high tree, and make the high, the low tree. Dry up the green tree, and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord, I have spoken, and I will do it. So they would have understood, again, you're needing hope. It looks, it looks bad, desolate where you are. God says, no, I'm going to take this tiny little, like a sprig or twig, this tender little thing, and I'm going to plant it in Israel, and it's going to grow. And all these high trees around you, this big evil Babylon empire, yeah, those intimidating things, yeah, they're going to be cut low. And I'm going to raise up something new. And it's going to be high. And everyone will know that I am the Lord. And it's going to be, it's going to declare who it is. And that's hope. When you go, man, everything looks terrible. There's a little bit of hope for us that we, the Israelites are reading this and say, look, in Israel, there's going to be this new tree. It's going to grow. We're going to have hope again. That something's good going to come out of this or what we're walking through. And they would have understood that they are part of, like there's this tree. It's going to come. It's going to grow. But yet, the part that Jesus referenced is about the birds. So if they thought, man, if we're representing the tree, who is the birds that God is talking about? Birds of every kind. People. When you begin to study Ezekiel, God often uses pictures of animals, uh, imagery and stuff like that. And so birds of every kind would be people, especially the people outside the covenant of God, the covenant that God made with the Israelites. The people outside of that, well, they'd be the Gentiles, so that'd be me and you, uh, we would be considered birds of every kind. And so you, in other words, you can say the nations of all people um, will come and find rest and nest in its branches. It's powerful because you go, all right, who is this tree really for? And you, and Jesus is starting to step on toes. So we start tying these two ideas together. Smallest thing makes the biggest difference. And who is this tree for? Who's supposed to find rest, be able to nest in it? Who is this about? It's about serving people. What's this parable really about, Jesus? It's really about serving people. The birds of every kind, Jesus is saying. He goes, you, you want to know how kingdom functions? You, know what, you want to know what kingdom looks like? You, 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 want, you, you think you know? Let me, let me challenge you. It looks like the smallest little insignificant looking thing that serves other people, that blesses other people. That's what kingdom looks like. That's what kingdom is about. The smallest, tiny little mustard seed that makes the biggest difference when it comes to serving other people. And he steps on their toes because they missed it. Because as dedicated as they were to studying scripture, gathering around this weekly to study uh, what's going on, to have it whole memorized, their entire culture, rhythms of life were centered around that, that they wanted to build a kingdom that's about God but ultimately, it was a kingdom about God, but that was for them and against others. Jesus is saying, that's not how the kingdom of God works. It's, it's God's kingdom. It's with you, but it's for 
others. It's not against others. It's for serving people. That's what kingdom is about. I go, and they missed it because they were so proud that they got to be God's chosen people and that their own pride separated from us versus them. That we get to build the kingdom. We have our kingdom and they don't. And pride separates us. Because isn't that what pride looks like? Like, pride looks like, man, look how great and all the amazing things I got going on in my life. I know I'm making you all nervous. This guy practiced this <laughs> earlier this week. But what is the pride of Sheboygan? Do, do, we, do we not think that pride is just as rampant today as it was then? And is not the pride of Sheboygan say, be self-independent, rely on no one, let everyone know you have an awesome life on the outside, and let nobody see the messed up things on the inside? It says, have enough money, um, but don't be showboaty. It says all, and we pay attention to, look how amazing we are. This little paradise on Lake Michigan, and we go, man, look at all those other towns. Good thing we don't live in all those other places. And the pride of Sheboygan says, look at us, and look at those people down there. And not even just Sheboygan pride, but also the pride of our own hearts, the pride of our own careers, our own jobs, our own families, our own accomplishments, our own kids. You, na- you, you can name it. Uh, to each of us is a little bit different, but we live in a world, again, that celebrates the big, the loud, and it just allows us to stand up here and go, look at all those people down there. Yeah. But here's the danger, though, when we let the pride, and this is what C.S. Lewis says. He says, a proud man is always looking down on things and people, and of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. As long as you're standing up here and you're looking down at everybody else, you begin to lose track of what's going on above you. Because you can now begin to build your own kingdom and make choices that are all about you and your wants and your desires and the things that you want for your life. And you go, look how how awesome I'm doing. And then look where everybody else is. And when we do that, we lose track of whose kingdom we're supposed to be building, of whose kingdom functions, of where that shows up. Because if we're so focused down here, we lose where the power and the authority and the presence of God stands. This is why in Proverbs it says, it is the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. When you know where I stand, I go, oh, This is whose kingdom this belongs to. This who has authority. This is where power is. This is where the presence of God is. And I know where I stand to that. I can now function and move in the kingdom of God. And when I lose that, when I'm constantly looking down at where other people or other families, other towns, other, then I lose looking where I stand with God. God, and I can begin to build my own kingdom and make choices that are just about me or my family or what I want. Jesus says it matters. The smallest thing matters because when we treat people that way, we find ourselves operating outside of God's heart because people matter to God, he used to go, what's wrong with building my own kingdom? It's because it impacts how you treat people and how you view people, and people matter to God, especially the outsider, the lost, the hurting, the weary. They matter to God. And Jesus comes, and he steps on some toes, and he says, how does the kingdom of God function? What does it look like? What should I compare it to? It looks like the smallest thing 
a mustard seed, an insignificant thing, and it's supposed to serve and bless other people. And you go, well, how do I know I'm not doing the small things for my kingdom instead of the small things for God's kingdom? And that's just the question of, well, how are we moving towards serving others? What's one step you can take in moving towards serving others? What are we doing in our lives that is a step toward serving others? That is the, the question that we all get to wrestle with because that is what Jesus says. Uh, it's, a, it's about, it's one step towards serving others. Especially one that steps on our pride especially one that inconveniences us, especially one that challenges us to put somebody else ahead of ourselves. Smallest thing makes the biggest difference. The smallest thing is the part of serving others. And who's the one who will take the low tree and make it high? Who's the one who will grow that tiny mustard seed into a tree that impacts everyone? It's the Lord. And this is a challenging thing to wrestle with. About a year and a half ago, uh, I went through, my wife and I went through something called CPAC, uh, which is like an assessment center where uh, essentially uh, we get, we're getting ready uh, to launch out of here and plant a church. And before we launch into a church, they say, hey, let's, let's make sure you have the tools and, and the things you need to succeed. And so you spend three and a half days and you pour your life out in front of a group of people, uh, your past, the things you want to do in your future, your life, your circumstances, and essentially you hold it out there and 10 or so people dig around it and they tell you what they find. And they found some stuff. I'm sure if we did that with you know, each and every single one of you, we'd find some stuff, but they found some stuff in my life, some good, but some not so good. One of the things they said, Sam, you're not very grateful. You don't talk very grateful. We just, you, you, we just don't see this gratitude. I, went, oh, man. I don't like that. <laughs> Why? It's, it's true. I like me. I like my world about me. I don't got time for gratitude. Sure, I'll say thank you here and there because my you know, mom taught me some manners, but I went, oh, what are you going to do about that? How do I respond now to that? So one of the things uh, I began to do is practice. Not only would I begin to write down some things I'm thankful for, one of the things I started doing was I would text the people who serve on our worship team. Uh, One of the hats I get to wear here at our Rice Church is I get to have the honor of uh, leading that. And so I would text them on Monday, or maybe Tuesday in case I forgot on Monday, a thank you, because they take their time and effort and dedication to serve us in worship, to put a time, their um, intentionality and, and just their heart and, into leading us in that. I go, man, have I taken that for granted? So I began to make it, I got to text people, show I am grateful. I got to give some gratitude to people. And you can ask them who would serve on the team if I do this. And some, some weeks I miss, but most of the weeks you can say, does, does he really text a simple thank you? Because God is asking, Sam, are you willing to do the mustard size seed thing? Send a simple text message and watch what I do with it. Oh, so he's starting to break my heart. He's starting to change my heart to a heart that, that is one that, that is about gratitude. And now I actually, you know, don't tell him this, but I actually like looking forward to being able to text my team now. Be like, yes, this is actually one of my favorite parts about Monday is I now get to text the team uh, because God is starting to do this work in my heart. And God goes, Sam, I go, yeah. He goes, the mustard size seed thing shows up in all places. Shows up in your marriage. Shows up in your parenting. Shows up in your friendships. Not just leading a worship team. And I have a choice to do a mustard-sized seed thing 
and to listen to how my wife's day went and not check out and think about football or Lord of the Rings trilogy or <laughs> the Roman Empire or so, I don't know, you name it. I have a choice that looks like a mustard size seed thing. So I'm going to listen to how my wife's day went. And it shows up in my parenting. I have three kids, all three of them, different personalities, respond differently. And so if I'm going to love my kids, I'm going to go have to love them at the mustard size seed level. It shows up in my friendships, my relationships. And the Lord is like, my Lord's showing me, he goes, it shows up in just every conversation you have. Because every conversation you have, Sam, you can choose to make it a conversation about the other person or you can make it about you. Which one are you going to pick? And that I can ask somebody, how your day is going? How, how, is it, how is it really going? How are you doing? And I can put all my agenda, what I want to talk about, what I think needs to happen, my own the, the dreams, desires, my own needs, put that down, and I can ask questions, and listen to this person and not try and give them advice, oh, this is what you should do, and try and fix them and all that kind of stuff and make it a, and then, or talk about how I went through something similar and make it all about me again. I can put all that down and I can simply just be with this person. That's a mustard size seed thing, one conversation, one at a time, that God says, will you trust me with that? Because Sam, if you're going to trust me with this, that means all those things I just put down, I just, just didn't lay them all over the ground. I'm going to have to go trust those in God's arms. Because how are my needs, how are the things I need to talk about, the stuff going on with me, how are they going to get met? And God says, well, are you going to trust me with those that I'll provide for those so you can love people, you can serve people at a mustard-sized seed level. That you can send a text message, that you can have a conversation with somebody and pay attention to the things that look like a mustard seed because they're that tiny that if you blinked, you might miss it. Lord, that's hard. He goes, yeah, I know but who's going to grow it? Because whose kingdom is this really about, Sam? Is this about your kingdom? Or is this a kingdom that's mine to give rest, to nest, to provide branches and love and to serve other people? Because that's how kingdom functions. If we're going to be a church... Uh, that serves people. I think sometimes it's easy to get, again, caught up in the flashy, big, loud, like, we're going to serve Sheboygan. Let's feed everybody. Let's build houses for every homeless person. Let's, and like, our minds can race after, man, we're going to make this big impact for the world. And I don't think uh, that dishonors God. I don't think God's against that. But God's looking for people who want to pay attention to the mustard size thing. Because that's how he says kingdom functions. And what does it mean to serve people, to serve a whole community where we paid attention to that level of stuff? What if we just start with the people next to us? What would it mean to pay attention to the mustard size, seed, insignificant, tiny looking thing so it serves and blesses everyone, and then it grows into a tree that blesses the people around us. What would that look like? But what terrifies me is, what if we miss that? What happens at the interactions where I miss the mustard size, the thing, and I make it about me? And I'm just starting to build my own kingdom. And often, when I start to build my own kingdom, I don't really like to pay attention to other people then. And that's what leaves a trail of people who feel unheard, unloved, unrespected, 
still weary and tired and lost and looking for rest. God is asking for me to pay attention to the mustard size seed thing. He's asking us to pay attention to the mustard size seed thing so that we can bless and serve other people. And when we do that, who gets the glory? And what I love is who said he's already going to do this? God said, I, the Lord, I have spoken and I will do this. That when you trust me with the mustard sized seed thing, I've already told you what I'm going to do with it and the impact that it is going to have. And he gets the glory. What I'm really excited about, though, is I see people in this church that pays attention to the mustard-sized seed, seed things in different ways. That I do see people who are willing to take a text message and make a difference. Uh, recently, I had a, a loss in my extended family. And I had somebody text me, how are you doing with that? I said, can we talk about it? And they sat with me and made the whole conversation about how I'm processing it. They paid attention to the mustard size level. What I'm excited about is to see the impact that that has continuously and the impact that a rise church community could have if we became people who paid attention to the mustard seed. So what's one step? What's one person that you can take? What's one thing you can do to move towards serving somebody else? Especially at something tiny. Not something huge, you don't gotta, uh, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know where your mind goes to, but what's just simply one thing you can do this week, today even, uh, before you leave the parking lot, uh, before you leave this room, you can say, Lord, would you help me pay attention to the mustard size, the seed things, because I want to be part of your kingdom. I want to function in how, what your kingdom looks like, and watch, and just watch what he does with that. Lord, as we get ready to come to your table, it reminds us that uh, we all stand in awe at the foot of the cross, that we are all in need of a Savior. Lord, we're grateful that uh, in your word it tells us a story of in the garden uh, sin entered the world, but then it tells a story that in the garden your body was buried to bring us new life and you rose again. And we're so grateful that the story doesn't end in the garden for us, that the story just started and that we get to see the end where we get to be with you for eternity. Lord, we ask that uh, you would make us a church that pays attention to the smallest thing, uh, that this is not something we can do in our own power, this is not something we can conquer on our own, but this is something that we have to do in your strength. And so would you be uh, the one who teaches us to be people who leans into your kingdom, who teaches us to walk in your ways, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. I'd like to uh, invite the elders to come up.
Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Uh, We get to gather, we get to partake together and remember the sacrifice that Jesus had for you and for me and for uh, the forgiveness that he offers us. They uh, will pass out the bread, and we ask that you would hold onto it so that we may partake uh, together. Let us partake together. In the same way, uh, way also he took the cup after supper saying, this is my cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes.
Let us partake together. Lord, we are grateful for uh, the forgiveness that you offer, Lord. We're grateful for the work that you're doing uh, in the hearts. Um, Would we be uh, people who continue to respond to what you're doing? Would we be people who continue to uh, lean in to this invitation to be part of your kingdom, Lord? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.